Boston. So um, at 11 years old, we're talking about 1813, uh, he announces to his mother, you know, mother, there are going to be enough in our family who are going to be educated. I'm going to get rich. So, you know, here he is. He is already just a young kid of 11 years old uh, who already thinks, like, I've got a bigger vision of my life than, you know, continuing to go to school and working on the farm. So he does. He stops going to school at that time, and he begins clerking for his cousin, Judge Blair, over in Hope. Um, and, you know, at the, at the beginning, he's, um, he's clerking behind the counter. Um, I know his mom had a concern that um, he was too young and that he shouldn't be against the counter because he would be pressing up against it and it might hurt his lungs. Um, that is one thing that was written um, because he really wasn't fully grown yet. Uh, but I'm sure in the beginning he did, you know, errands and any other thing that had to be done, you know, over there at the Hope, um, at the Hope store. And, um, but eventually, uh, you know, he's so ambitious that his cousin sees that he can give him more responsibility. So he starts writing uh, contracts with people. He starts collecting debt. Um, he starts working even for other people in Belvedere who um, also train him on how all of this, um, these business transactions uh, go on. And really, his, um, he had a great reputation. His, uh, you know, he was touted one time as being the most um, congenial uh, salesperson uh, at a store, at a, a clerk at a store in all of Warren County. So he really was gaining a reputation for himself as to someone who could work with people and he could tell, you know, and really figure out how to get them what they wanted. Um, so those were some important lessons he was learning um, early on in his life. However, at age 13, his father dies. He actually dies on the farm um, back at Beaver Brook. And that for um, a short time, um, probably a year or two, really, um, stops, you know, John I. Blair's involvement with any mercantile business. Uh, he goes back to help uh, running the farm with his um, mother and his siblings. And um, at that point, it's even known that his uh, he's really involved with uh, the financial um, running of the farm and helping his mom with that aspect. Um, but eventually he does go back to his cousin's store and like I said, he was working with the other people in Belvedere to really, you know, hone in on his um, mathematical skills because he really had a great mind for math. And um, that was really one thing that propelled him um, in um, getting the status that he had by the end of his life. So at age 19, um, you know, he sees an opportunity like a lot of people. Hey, I, you know, I got this all this training. I've got these ideas. Uh, maybe I don't want to, you know, work for my cousin anymore. So um, at first, uh, they he does um, they do have a partnership, but they come over to here to what is uh, what was being called Butts Bridge still at that time. We're talking about um, 1820 or so. He's about 18 or 19 years old, and um, it was probably like 1821. Um, and he sets up a store with his cousin in the storehouse of uh, William Hankinson who is the person who built our mill here. He was also married to Margaret Christman, who is another person who is a descendant of um, someone who married into the Shippen family. Um, but they see the opportunity here because they know that people are coming from the Pequari area, coming down what was then called the Great Road and getting all their, um, all their goods down along the river, or maybe they were bringing it even to the river, um, to get it down to the Delaware River, okay? So he saw this as an important crossroads and that, of course, location, location, location. You know, he wanted to be where um, all the traffic was going to be and he could just get passers-by who would come into his store. So he does um, set up the store inside of the storehouse of uh, William Hankinson. But within a couple years, he decides he wants to be a sole proprietor and he breaks away from his cousin, um, who's also who's John, this Judge John Blair. Um, he breaks away from him, so he's on his own. Um, in 1826, he marries uh, Saint, uh, Nancy Ann Locke. Um, she's from the um, Hearst Corner area, um, and she has you know illustrious background too uh, with her family heritage. Um, 
And uh, between 1827 and 1838, they have four children. Um, I'll tell you their names right now. Uh, Emma Elizabeth was the oldest. Uh, she married, okay, just to tell you how uh, kind of prominent uh, the Blairs, the Vales um, were, John I. Blair's daughter, Emma, marries the founder of Scribner Publishing, Charles Scribner. So, um, you know, they've got some real, you know, uh, clout as far as who their, um, you know, who their family is and who they're networking with. The um, DeWitt Clinton was a, uh, a son that was born. Uh, he went by Clinton mostly and Marcus, uh, Marcus Blair and Aurelia. So that was between 1827 and 1838. Uh, they have the four children. Um, by the um, early 1830s, um, the Scrantons come to the area, okay? And um, there's two Scranton brothers who, uh, George and Selden, who come. And um, first, I think Selden was down in Philadelphia area and he was working for uh, a William uh, Henry, who at the time, um, he was working at a foundry down there, I believe. Um, but William Henry needed help up here. He was the owner at the time. And um, so Selden uh, Scranton came up here to do bookkeeping for him. So, you know, you've got Selden uh, Scranton. He's working over at Oxford Furnace. Um, but George, when he comes to town, he actually starts to work for John I. Blair at first. John I. Blair wanted him to run his Gravel Hill store right here. And um, it ends up that I think he went up to Marksboro to work uh, where John I. Blair's brother James had a store up there. Now, I didn't mention that fact yet, but during this whole time frame, you know, John I. Blair really was someone instrumental in seeing that a chain store mentality was an important thing. He realized that if I buy this little part, you know, um, I'm gonna have to charge uh, bigger prices and then my markup isn't gonna be as good. So why don't I have many stores where I can bulk buy and then my markup will be bigger when I go to sell it to, um, you know, my customers. So he had several stores. He had one in Marksboro, Johnsonburg, um, Stroudsburg there was one, um, Hunts, Huntsville, I think um, I saw recently, um, and just re recapping this information again. Um, so, you know, and all of his uh, siblings were the ones, his siblings, his brother-in-laws, who were running these stores. So his brother James is up in Marksboro, and, um, you know, he wants, uh, he wants uh, James to get involved with George, who was about 10 years younger. Um, George was about 10 years younger than John I, but James was also younger. So maybe James and um, George were about the same age. Um, whether James liked the idea or not, who knows, but, um, you know, they do start these relationships with the Scrantons. Um, by 1830, William Hankinson dies. Now, as you remember, he was the one who John I. Blair had originally had a storehouse with, and, um, you know, he actually was um, very um, integrally involved with him and managing some of his businesses and things like that. Um, they really struck up a relationship um, between the two. But when he dies in 1830, so much so, the Hankinsons did not have any children and not at the favor of William Hankinson's siblings, John I. Blair is put in charge of the estate. Um, he's gonna be managing it for William Hankinson's wife, Margaret. Um, the estate at that time was uh, $40,000 is what John I. Blair got paid to manage the estate. Um, I looked it up one time. I think it's worth something like $1 million in, in today's dollars. So you can imagine, on top of being a great you know, business, a savvy business person, John I. Blair gets this money. He gets this huge lot of money. So um, how he exactly invested it, I, I can't really say, but he definitely you know, became a prominent at that time. Um, he builds the house that the family would uh, live in, which was um, up on Blair Place here in Blairstown, right next to where our Blair Falls is. If you were to look up to the right-hand side as you're facing Blair Falls, that's where the Blair Mansion once sat. And um, so that became um, being built in the, um, about 1833. John I. Blair also says, hey, I want my own little store here. So he builds an individual store that is just his own and um, he can, you know, it's a more convenient than being in a storehouse. So um, he gets himself his own little store here. Um, I didn't mention it, but he had also made himself postmaster of the town, 
uh, which if you're not familiar with it, that's two benefits of being a store owner and being the post postmaster. You don't have to pay shipping in or shipping out. Uh, those fees are dropped. And also you have a huge amount of customers coming to the town, um, town to get their mail and they're in your store. So um, great benefit to being postmaster. Um, he's also um, acquiring and doing property, um, you know, acquiring properties. He gets into cotton manufacturing. Um, he's getting interested in mills. Um, he's still interested in buying things from over at Oxford Furnace. He's, he's not yet, um, you know, um, an owner over there or a part owner. He's, um, but he's utilizing the products that are coming from there, mostly nails, okay? And uh, really that is one thing that the Scranton brothers and uh, John I. Blair realized that there needed to be, there was an absence of nail production in, um, in Warren County in those years. So um, 1835, uh, George Scranton decides he doesn't want to be working for the Blairs anymore. And about that time, um, Selden, his brother, um, is working his way up into the uh, echelon there at, um, at Oxford Furnace. And how did he do that? Well, he married the boss's daughter. So um, uh, William uh, Henry is the one who's, you know, the manager or the owner at the time. And um, he marries his daughter. I don't uh, recall her name at the time, but um, so that was definitely a plus for him. Uh, William Henry, you know, also like, you know, went to uh, Selden Shannon because he needed finances and um, that type of thing. But, um, uh, so the, uh, so the Scrantons, you know, uh, join up, the brothers do, and, um, they decide that, uh, you know, they're, they're going to have ownership together of it. And within the next few years though, they fall on some hard times. The, the, uh, the furnace isn't doing so well. And that is basically just because of economic conditions, you know, that were happening at the time, not through any fault of their own, but who just got almost a million dollars, you know, or $400,000. Uh, John I. Blair, he's, he's sitting pretty, if you ask me, and uh, he sees that the Scrantons are in trouble. Okay, well, let me go over and help them. I'll help them. Um, I'll loan them the money that they need, but it's not gonna be a loan. I want to have one-fifth ownership, you know, in, at Oxford Furnace. So that's what happens, and that, in 1839, is how John I. Blair himself gets to be um, involved um, as an owner at Oxford Furnace. And um, about that same time, William Henry, who's the father-in-law of, um, of Selden Sh um, Scranton, um, is scouting out new locations for um, other places where they can mine and they can you know, have, um, have iron production. And so he goes up to a place called Slocum Hollow um, and he sees an opportunity up there and he knows that John I. Blair might also know of that opportunity. So um, father-in-law William comes running back down, you know, to Oxford and says, we've got to grab that land up there before John I. Blair, you know, he gets it. And they do. So, um, you know, I've been talking about the Scrantons the whole time. What happens? They do um, relocate up there. They open up what was, in 1848, they open up what was the uh, Lackawanna, um, iron and coal company and um, so they you know they relocate basically up to that area um, and eventually the town gets named in their honor so Scranton Pennsylvania those people started right here in Warren County in Oxford so um, at the same time uh, in the 1840s uh, John I. Blair um, he is seeing that uh, railroad production and railroad as a means of transportation is a, a better way to go. Um, you don't have to worry about getting your goods to a river. Um, you know, you don't have to worry about having uh, wagons and trains and everything. What you need is a railroad. You can, and if you own the railroad, you know, that would be an important thing. So he, um, he starts building the Os Oswego Railroad. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And um, then he starts even um, getting into a railroad here in Warren County, which is the Warren Railroad. Uh, that was a needed uh, connection between the railroads that were coming from the Slocum Hollow Scranton area um, down through um, Pennsylvania. And they would end though, they would end in Portland. And what they needed to do was have a connector, a connecting railroad that would get those goods, that coal, 
and um, get it to the port cities and um, Elizabeth and, and those towns um, where um, you know they could they could sell it and get their profit from it. So um, John I. Glare and the Scrans come up um, with the idea that they need to have this Warren Railroad. So in the 1850s, uh, the railroad was in the production um, and in the talks and in the production um, time frame of it. Um, and really, I think I mentioned it already, but it went from Hampton um, to uh, Portland. Okay, so that that is the span of where the railroad went. And of course, where is it going to go through? Oxford, of course, because you're still making iron there. They're still needing to transport things. They needed to have the railroad close by. So, in fact, um, you know, they decided there was, I think, two tunnels that were built at um, in the whole span of the railroad, and one of them was at Oxford, and it was the Van Nest Gap Tunnel. Um, so that was a very long tunnel um, for those days. I'd say it was about three thousand feet long. Um, it was through an area that was had especially hard rock and it had slate um, that was mixed in with all that. So it was really hard um, getting through that mountain. Uh, they couldn't wait though. So um, the railroad did have a temporary track uh, that bypassed it for a number of years um, until the tunnel could be completed. But it finally was in 1862. Uh, the Warren Railroad um, uh, and the Van Nest Gap Tunnel were finally uh, completed. So um, that is um, just uh, an inkling of what happened. Now, the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad eventually, um, different all different railroads merged to become one um, one railroad. That was the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western. Um, the Warren Railroad itself was leased and then eventually um, be merged into the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western. Um, uh, the town of Delaware was um, set up as a um, terminus point uh, that would later be used by um, this New York, Susquehanna, and Western Railroad that came um, from here in Blairstown. That's later on though. Um, so let me just um, say, that that was the beginning of John I. Blair's uh, ventures into railroads, okay? But he had all kinds of um, investments and things that he uh, was involved with. I'm gonna go through those in just a minute, but I wanna just say that in 1860, um, he was the Republican delegate from New Jersey, and uh, he was a staunch Republican his whole life, but he went out to the uh, Chicago um, Convention and he um, takes a side trip to their number one person that the Republicans want to elect in those days, and that was um, Abraham Lincoln. So he and a, and a bunch of other delegates go down to Springfield, Illinois, and um, have conversations with Lincoln. It's not the last time that he would be face to face with Lincoln. And um, they did discuss things about you know what the importance of the railroads were going to be and how that was the future of. Um, of you know uh, the United States and um, and really making a you know railroad that went from coast to coast um, you know wouldn't that be important? So um, that happened in um, 1860, and then of course um, you know we get into the Civil War. Uh, John I. Blair is still in communication. He went to Washington a couple of times to meet with Lincoln and um, discuss how um, things were going to go uh, as far as the railroads were concerned. Um, and, um, you know, they do, they, you know, it is in the works that a transcontinental railroad is needed. So John I. Blair, you know, utilizing all of his knowledge that he's had here on the East Coast decides, hey, I've got to take my knowledge and I've got to expand out West and I've got to, um, you know, work to, to make this, help make this railroad happen. And he does. Uh, he was a foremost person in Iowa as far as um, uh, taking advantage of um, contracts that uh, other